Well, if there's one lesson we can learn from tonight's story, it's don't eat the grey slime. Time once again to sit back and relax at your favourite drink, my dear friends. And listen. Two men stood in the billiard room of an old country house, talking. Play, which had been of a half-hearted nature, was over, and they sat down at the open window, looking out over the park, stretching away beneath them, conversing idly. Your time's nearly up, Jim, said one at length. This time six weeks, you'll be yawning out of the honeymoon, and cursing the man, uh, woman, I mean, who invented them. Jem Benson stretched his long limbs in the chair and grunted in dissent. "'I've never understood it,' continued Wilfred Carr, yawning. "'It's not in my line at all. I never had money enough for my own wants, let alone for two. Perhaps if I were as rich as you or Croesus, I might regard it differently.' There was sufficient meaning in the latter part of the remark for his cousin to forbear to reply to it. He continued to gaze out of the window and to smoke slowly. "'Not being as rich as Croesus or you,' resumed Carr, regarding him from beneath lowered lids, "'I paddle my own canoe down the stream of time, and, tying it to my friend's doorposts, go in to eat their dinners.' Oh, "'Quite Venetian,' said Jem Benson, still looking out of the window. It's not a bad thing for you, Wilfred, that you have the doorposts and dinners and, well, friends. Carr grunted in his turn. Uh, seriously, though, Jem, he said slowly, you're a lucky fellow, a very lucky fellow. If there's a better girl above ground than Olive, I should like to see her. Yes, said the other quietly. Well, she is an exceptional girl, continued Carr, staring out of the window. She's so good and gentle. She thinks you are a bundle of all the virtues. He laughed frankly and joyously, but the other man did not join him. A strong sense of right and wrong, though, continued Carr, musingly. Do you know, I believe that if she found out what you were not, sir... Uh... Not what? demanded Benson, turning upon him fiercely. Not what? "'Everything that you are,' returned his cousin, with a grin that belied his words. "'Well, I believe she'd drop you.' "'Talk about something else,' said Benson slowly. "'Your pleasantries are not always in the best taste.' Wilfred Carr rose, and, taking a cue from the rack, bent over the board and practised one or two favourite shots. "'Ah, oh, the only other subject I can talk about just at present is my own financial affairs,' he said slowly as he walked round the table. Talk about something else, Benson said again, bluntly. Oh, and the uh, two things are connected, said Carr. Dropping his cue, he half sat on the table and eyed his cousin. There was a long silence. Benson pitched the end of his cigar out of the window and, leaning back, closed his eyes. Do you, um, follow me? inquired Carr at length. Benson opened his eyes and nodded at the window. "'Do you want to follow my cigar?' he demanded. "'Oh, I should prefer to depart by the usual way for your sake,' returned the other, unabashed. "'If I left by the window, all sorts of questions would be asked, and you know how talkative a chap I am.' "'Oh, so long as you don't talk about my affairs,' returned the other, restraining himself by an obvious effort. You can talk yourself hoarse. <sighs> ah, I'm in a mess, said Carr slowly. A devil of a mess. If I don't raise fifteen hundred by this day fortnight, I may be getting my board and lodging free. Would that be any change? questioned Benson. Well, the um, quality would, retorted the other. The address would also not be good. Seriously, Jem, will you let me have the fifteen hundred? No, said the other, simply. Carr went white. It's to save me from ruin, he said thickly. I've helped you till I'm tired, 
said Benson, turning and regarding him, and it is all to no good. If you've got into a mess, get out of it. You should not be so fond of giving autographs away. Yeah, it's foolish, I admit, said Carr deliberately. I won't do so any more. Oh, by the way, I've got some to sell. You needn't sneer. They're not my own. Whose are they? inquired the other. Oh, uh, yours. Benson got up from his chair and crossed over to him. What is this? he asked quietly. Blackmail? Call it what you like, said Carr. I've got some letters for sale. Price, fifteen hundred. And I know a man who would buy them at that price for the mere chance of getting Olive from you. Well, I'll give you first offer. If you've got any letters bearing my signature, you'll be good enough to give them to me, said Benson, very slowly. <sighs> They're mine, said Carr lightly, given to me by the lady you wrote them to. Oh, I must say they are not all in the best possible taste. His cousin reached forward suddenly, and, catching him by the collar of his coat, pinned him down on the table. Give me those letters, he breathed, sticking his face close to Carr's. Oh, they're not here, said Carr, struggling. I'm not a fool. Let me go or I'll raise the price. The other man raised him from the table in his powerful hands, apparently with the intention of dashing his head against it. Then suddenly, his hold relaxed as an astonished-looking maidservant entered the room with letters. Carr sat up hastily. Uh, "'That's how it was done,' said Benson, for the girl's benefit, as he took the letters. "'Oh, I don't wonder at the other man making him pay for it, then,' said Carr, blandly. "'You will give me those letters?' asked Benson, suggestively, as the girl left the room. "'Um, at the price I mentioned, yes,' said Carr. "'But so sure as I am a living man, if you lay your clumsy hands on me again, I'll double it now.' I'll leave you for a time while you think it over. He took a cigar from the box and, lighting it carefully, quitted the room. His cousin waited until the door had closed behind him and then, turning to the window, sat there in a fit of fury as silent as it was terrible. The air was fresh and sweet from the park, heavy with the scent of new-mown grass. The fragrance of a cigar was now added to it, and glancing out he saw his cousin pacing slowly by. He rose and went to the door, and then, apparently altering his mind, he returned to the window and watched the figure of his cousin as it moved slowly away into the moonlight. Then he rose again, and, for a long time, the room was empty. It was empty when Mrs. Benson came in some time later to say goodnight to her son on her way to bed. She walked slowly round the table, and, pausing at the window, gazed from it in idle thought, until she saw the figure of her son advancing rapid strides toward the house. He looked up at the window. "'Good night,' said she. "'Good night,' said Benson, in a deep voice. "'Where is Wilfred?' "'Oh, um, he's gone,' said Benson. "'Gone?' "'We had a few words.' He was wanting money again, and I gave him a piece of my mind. I don't think we shall see him again. Oh, poor Wilfred, sighed Mrs. Benson. He's always in trouble of some sort. I hope that you weren't too hard upon him. <laughs> no more than he deserved, said her son sternly. Good night. The well, which had long ago fallen into disuse, was almost hidden by the thick tangle of undergrowth which ran riot at the corner of the old park. It was partly covered by the shrunken half of a lid, above which a rusty windlass creaked in company with the music of the pines the, when the wind blew strongly. The full light of the sun never reached it, and the ground surrounding it was moist and green when other parts of the park were gaping with the heat. Two people walking slowly round the park in the fragrant stillness of a summer evening strayed in the direction of the well. Oh, no use going through this wilderness, Olive, said Benson, pausing on the outskirts of the pines and eyeing with some disfavour the gloom beyond. Best part of the park, said the girl briskly. Oh, you know it's my favourite spot. 
I know you're very fond of sitting on the coping, said the man slowly, and I wish you wouldn't. One day you'll lean back too far and fall in. And then make the acquaintance of truth, said Olive lightly. Come along. She ran from him and was lost in the shadow of the pines, the bracken crackling beneath her as her feet ran across it. Her companion followed slowly, and, emerging from the gloom, saw her poised daintily on the edge of the well, with her feet hidden in the rank grass and nettles which surrounded it. She motioned her companion to take a seat by her side, and smiled softly as she felt a strong arm passed around her waist. "'Oh, I like this place,' said she, breaking a long silence. "'It is so dismal, so uncanny. Do you know I wouldn't dare sit there alone, Jem? I should imagine all sorts of dreadful things were hidden beneath those bushes and trees, waiting to spring out on me. Oh! Well, you'd better let me take you in, said her companion tenderly. The well isn't always wholesome, especially in the hot weather. Let's make a move. The girl gave an obstinate little shake, and settled herself more securely on her seat. Oh, smoke your cigar in peace, she said quietly. I'm settled here for a quiet talk. Oh, sir, anything heard of Wilfred yet? Uh, nothing. Oh, quite a dramatic disappearance, isn't it? She continued. Another scrape, I suppose, and another letter for you in the same old strain. Oh, dear Jem, help me out. Jem Benson blew a cloud of fragrant smoke into the air and holding his cigar between his teeth, brushed away the ash from his coat sleeves. "'I wonder what he would have done without you,' said the girl, pressing his arm affectionately. "'Gone under long ago, I suppose. When we are married, Jem, I will presume upon the relationship to lecture him. He is very wild, but he has his good points, the poor fellow.' Oh, "'I never saw them,' said Benson, with startling bitterness. "'God knows I never saw them. Well, he's nobody's enemy but his own, said the girl, startled by his outburst. Oh, you don't know much about him, said the other sharply. He was not above blackmail, not above ruining the life of a friend to do himself a benefit. A loafer, a cur and a liar. The girl looked at him soberly but timidly and took his arm without a word, and they both sat silent while evening deepened into night and the beams of the moon filtering through the branches, surrounded them with a silver network. Her head sank upon his shoulder, till suddenly, with a sharp cry, she sprang to her feet. "'What was that?' she cried breathlessly. "'What was what?' demanded Benson, springing up and clutching her fast by the arm. She caught her breath and tried to laugh. Oh, "'You're hurting me, Jem. His hold relaxed. "'What is the matter?' he asked gently. "'What was it that startled you?' "'I was startled,' she said slowly, putting her hands on his shoulder. "'I suppose the words I used just now were ringing in my ears, "'but I fancied that someone behind us whispered, "'Jem, help me out.' "'Fancy,' repeated Benson, and his voice shook. "'But these fancies are not good for you.' You are frightened at the dark and the gloom of these trees. <laughs> Let me take you back to the house. No, I'm not frightened, said the girl, reseating herself. I should never be really frightened of anything when you were with me, Jem. I'm surprised at myself for being so silly. The man made no reply but stood, a strong, dark figure, a yard or two from the well, as though waiting for her to join him. Oh, come and sit down, sir cried Olive, patting the brickwork with her small white hand. One would think you didn't like your company. He obeyed slowly and took a seat by her side, drawing so hard at his cigar that the light of it shone upon his fare at every breath. He passed his arm, firm and rigid as steel, behind her, with his hand resting on the brickwork beyond. Are you warm enough? he asked tenderly, as she made a little movement. Uh, pretty fair she shivered. One oughtn't to be cold at this time of year, but there's a cold, damp air comes up from that well. As she spoke, a faint splash sounded from the depths below, and 
For the second time that evening, she sprang from the well with a little cry of dismay. What is it now? he asked in a fearful voice. He stood by her side and gazed at the well, as though half expecting to see the cause of her alarm emerge from it. Oh, my bracelet! she cried in distress. Look at my poor mother's bracelet. I've dropped it down the well. Your bracelet? repeated Benson dully. Your bracelet? The diamond one? Oh, that was my mother's, said Olive. Oh, we can't get it back, surely. Look, we must have the water drained off. Your bracelet? repeated Benson stupidly. Jim? said the girl in terrified tones. Dear Jim, what's the matter? For the man she loved was standing, regarding her with horror. The moon which touched it was not responsible for all the whiteness of the distorted face, and she shrank back in fear to the edge of the well. He saw her fear and, by a mighty effort, regained his composure and took her hand. Poor little girl, he murmured. You frightened me. I was not looking when you cried, and I thought that you were slipping from my arms. Down, down. His voice broke, and the girl, throwing herself into his arms, clung to him convulsively. There, there, said Benson fondly. Don't cry, don't cry. Tomorrow, said Olive, half laughing, half crying. We'll all come round the well with hook and line and fish for it. It'll be a, quite a new sport. No, we must try some other way, said Benson. You shall have it back. How? asked the girl. Oh, you shall see, said Benson. Tomorrow morning, at latest, you shall have it back. Till then, promise me that you will not mention your loss to anyone. Promise? I promise, said Olive, wonderingly. But why not? Well, it's of great value, for one thing. And, but, uh, well, there are many reasons. For one thing, it is my duty to get it for you. Well, wouldn't you like to jump down for it? She asked mischievously. Listen. She stooped for a stone and dropped it down. Oh, fancy being where that is now, she said, peering into the blackness. Fancy going round and round like a mouse in a pail. Clutching at the slimy sides, with the water filling your mouth, and looking up to the little patch of sky above. You'd better come in, said Benson, very quietly. You're developing a taste for the morbid and horrible. The girl turned, and taking his arm, walked slowly in the direction of the house. Mrs. Benson, who was sitting in the porch, rose to receive them. Oh, you shouldn't have kept her out so long, she said chidingly. Where have you been? Oh, sitting on the well, said Olive, smiling, discussing our future. Oh, I don't believe that place is healthy, said Mrs. Benson, emphatically. I really think it might be filled in, Jem. All right, said her son slowly. Pity it wasn't filled in long ago. He took the chair vacated by his mother as she entered the house with Olive, and with his hands hanging limply over the sides, sat in deep thought. After a time he rose, and, going upstairs to a room which was set apart for sporting requisites, selected a sea fishing line and some hooks, and stole softly downstairs again. He walked swiftly across the park in the direction of the well, turning before he entered the shadow of the trees to look back at the lighted windows of the house. Then, having arranged his line, he sat on the edge of the well and cautiously lowered it. He sat with his lips compressed, occasionally looking about him in a startled fashion, as though he half expected to see something peering at him from the belt of trees. Time after time he lowered his line until at length, in pulling it up, he heard a little metallic tinkle against the side of the well. He held his breath then, and forgetting his fears, drew the line in inch by inch, so as not to lose its precious burden. His pulse beat rapidly, and his eyes were bright. As the line came slowly in, he saw the catch hanging to the hook, and with a steady hand drew the last few feet in. And then he saw that, instead of the bracelet, he'd hooked a bunch of keys. 
With a faint cry, he shook them from the hook into the water below, and stood breathing heavily. Not a sound broke the stillness of the night. He walked up and down a bit and stretched his great muscles. Then he came back to the well and resumed his task. For an hour or more, the line was lowered without result. In his eagerness, he forgot his fears, and with eyes bent down the well, fished slowly and carefully. Twice the hook became entangled in something, and was with difficulty released. It caught a third time, and all his efforts failed to free it. Then he dropped the line down the well, and, with head bent, walked back toward the house. He went first to the stables at the rear, and then, retiring to his room for some time, paced restlessly up and down. And then, without removing his clothes, he flung himself upon the bed and fell into a troubled sleep. Long before anybody else was astir, he arose and stole softly downstairs. The sunlight was stealing in at every crevice and flashing in long streaks across the darkened rooms. The dining room into which he looked struck chill and cheerless in the dark yellow light which came through the lowered blind. He remembered that it had been the same appearance when his father had laid dead in the house. Now, as then, everything seemed ghastly and unreal. The very chairs standing as their occupants had left them the night before seemed to be indulging in some dark communication of ideas. Slowly and noiselessly, he opened the hall door and passed into the fragrant air beyond. The sun was shining on the drenched grass and trees, and slowly vanishing white mist rolled like smoke about the grounds. For a moment he stood, breathing deeply the sweet air of the morning, and then walked slowly in the direction of the stables. The rusty creaking of a pump handle and a spatter of water upon the red-tiled courtyard showed that someone else was astir, and a few steps farther he beheld a brawny, sandy-haired man gasping wildly under severe self-infliction at the pump. "'Everything ready, George?' he asked quietly. "'Oh, yes, sir,' said the man, straightening up suddenly and touching his forehead. "'Bob's just finishing the arrangements inside. "'It's a lovely morning for a dip. "'Oh, that water in the well must be just icy.' "'I'll be as quick as you can,' said Benson impatiently. "'Aye, very good, sir,' said George, burnishing his face harshly with a very small towel which had been hanging over the top of the pump. Oi, hurry up, Bob. In answer to his summons, a man appeared at the door of the stable with a coil of stout rope over his arm and a large metal candlestick in his hand. Just to try the air, sir, said George, following his master's glance. Oh, a well gets rather foul sometimes, but if a candle can live down it, then a man can too. His master nodded, and the man, hastily pulling up the neck of his shirt and thrusting his arms into his coat, followed him as he led the way slowly to the well. Oh, uh, "'Beg pardon, sir,' said George, drawing up to his side. "'But you are not looking over and above well this morning. Uh, if you let me go down, I'd enjoy the bath.' Uh, "'No, no,' said Benson, peremptorily. "'You ain't fit to go down, sir,' persisted his follower. "'I've never seen you look so before.' Now, if... Mind your business, said his master curtly. Well, George became silent, and the three walked with swinging strides through the long, wet grass to the well. Bob flung the rope on the ground, and at a sign from his master, handed him the candlestick. Oh, here's the line for it, sir, said Bob, fumbling in his pockets. Benson took it from him and slowly tied it to the candlestick. Then he placed it on the edge of the well, and, striking a match, lit the candle and began to slowly lower it. "'Hold hard, sir,' said George, quickly, laying his hand on his arm. "'You must tilt it, or the string will burn through.' Even as he spoke, the string parted, and the candlestick fell into the water below. Benson swore quietly. "'I'll soon get another,' said George, starting up. "'Never mind.' Look, the well's all right, said Benson. It won't take a moment, sir, said the other over his shoulder. Look, are you the master here or am I? 
said Benson hoarsely. George came back slowly, a glance at his master's face stopping the protest upon his tongue, and he stood by watching him sulkily as he sat on the well and removed his outer garments. Both men watched him curiously, as having completed his preparations, he stood grim and silent, with his hands by his sides. Oh, I wish you'd let me go, sir, said George, plucking up courage to address him. You ain't fit to go. You've got a chill or something. I shouldn't wonder it's the typhoid. Oh, they've got it in the village bad. For a moment Benson looked at him angrily, and then his gaze softened. Not this time, George, he said quietly. He took the looped end of the rope and placed it under his arms, and sitting down threw one leg over the side of the well. How are you going to go about it, sir? queried George, laying hold of the rope and signing to Bob to do the same. I'll call out when I reach the water, said Benson, then pay out three yards more quickly so that I can get to the bottom. Aye, very good, sir, answered Bob. Their master threw the other leg over the coping and sat motionless. His back was turned toward the men as he sat with head bent, looking down the shaft. He sat for so long that George became uneasy. Uh, all right, sir, he inquired. Yes, said Benson slowly. If I tug at the rope, George, pull up at once. Right, lower away. The rope passed steadily through their hands until a hollow cry from the darkness below and a faint splashing warned them that he'd reached the water. They gave him three yards more, and stood with a relaxed grasp and strained ears, waiting. Oh, he's gone under, said Bob in a low voice. The other nodded, and, moistening his huge palms, took a firmer grip of the rope. Fully a minute passed, and the men began to exchange uneasy glances. And then a sudden tremendous jerk, followed by a series of feebler ones, nearly tore the rope from their grasp. Pull, said George, placing one foot on the side and hauling desperately. Pull, pull, he's stuck fast, he's not coming, pull. In response to their terrific exertions, the rope came slowly in, inch by inch, until at length a violent splashing was heard and at the same moment a scream of unutterable horror came echoing up the shaft. Oh, what a weight he is, panted Bob. Oh, he's stuck fast or something. Keep still, sir, for heaven's sake, keep still. For the taut rope was being jerked violently by the struggles of the weight at the end of it. Both men, with grunts and sighs, hauled it in foot by foot. All right, sir, cried George cheerfully. He had one foot against the well and was pulling manfully. The burden was nearing the top. A long pull and a strong pull, and the face of a dead man with mud in his eyes and nostrils came peering over the edge. Behind it was the ghastly face of his master. But this he saw too late, for with a great cry he let go of his hold of the rope and stepped back. The suddenness overthrew his assistant, and the rope tore through his hands. And there was a frightful splash. Oh, you fool, stammered Bob, and ran to the well helplessly. God, run, cried George. Run for another line. He bent over the coping and called eagerly down as his assistant sped back to the stable, shouting wildly. His voice re-echoed down the shaft. But all else was silence. It was a dark, starless night. We were becalmed in the northern Pacific. Our exact position I did not know, for the sun had been hidden during the course of a weary, breathless week by a thin haze which had seemed to float above us, about the height of our mastheads, at whiles descending and shrouding the surrounding sea. With there being no wind, we'd steadied the tiller, and I was the only man on deck. The crew, consisting of two men and a boy, were sleeping forward in their den, while Will, my friend and the master of our little craft, was aft in his bunk on the port side of the little cabin. Suddenly, 
from out of the surrounding darkness, there came a hail. Schooner, ahoy! The cry was so unexpected that I gave no immediate answer because of my surprise. It came again, a voice curiously throaty and inhuman, calling from somewhere upon the dark sea away on our poor broadside. Schooner, ahoy! Hello, I sung out, having gathered my wit somewhat. What are you? What do you want? Oh, you need not be afraid, answered the queer voice, having probably noticed some trace of confusion in my tone. I am only an old uh, man. Ah, oh, the poor sounded odd, but it was only afterward that they came back to me with any significance. Oh, why don't you come alongside then? I queried somewhat snappishly, for I liked not his hinting at my having been a trifle shaken. I, uh, I can't. It, it wouldn't be safe. I, uh, the voice broke off, and then there was silence. What do you mean? I asked, growing more and more astonished. What's not safe? I mean, where are you? I listened for a moment, but there came no answer. And then a sudden indefinite suspicion of I knew not what coming to me. I stepped swiftly to the binnacle and took out the lighted lamp. At the same time I knocked on the deck with my heel to waken Will. Then I was back at the side, throwing the yellow funnel of light out into the silent immensity beyond our rail. As I did so, I heard a slight muffled cry, and then the sound of a splash as though someone had dipped oars abruptly. Yet I cannot say with certainty that I saw anything, well, save it seemed to me that with the first flash of the light there had been something upon the waters, where now there was nothing. Hello there, I called. What foolery is this? But there came only the indistinct sounds of a boat being pulled away into the night. Then I heard Will's voice from the direction of the after scuttle. What's up, George? Come here, Will, I said. What is it? he asked, coming across the deck. I told him the queer thing that had happened. Well, he put several questions. And then, after a moment's silence, he raised his hands to his lips and hailed. Boat! Ahoy! From a long distance away, there came back to us a faint reply, and my companion repeated his call. Presently, after a short period of silence, there grew on our hearing the muffled sound of oars, at which Will hailed again. This time there was a reply. Put away the light. Damned if I will, I muttered, but Will told me to do as the voice bade. I shoved it down under the bulwarks. Come nearer, he said, and the oar strokes continued. Then, when apparently some half-dozen fathoms distance, they again ceased. Come alongside, exclaimed Will. There's nothing to be frightened of aboard here. Promise that you will not show the light. What's to do with you? I burst out. That you're so infernally afraid of the light. Because, began the voice, and stopped short. Because what? I asked quickly. Will put his hand on my shoulder. Shut up a minute, old man, he said in a low voice. Let me tackle him. He leaned more over the rail. See here, mister, he said. This is a pretty queer business, and you coming upon us like this, right out in the middle of the blessed Pacific. How are we to know what sort of a hanky-panky trick you're up to? You say there's only one of you. How are we to know unless we get a squint of you, eh? What's your objection to the light, anyway? As he finished, I heard the noise of the oars again, and then the voice came, but now from a greater distance, and sounding extremely hopeless and pathetic. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I would not have troubled you, only I'm hungry, and so is she. The voice died away, and the sound of the oars, dipping irregularly, was borne to us. Stop! sang out Will. I don't want to drive you away. C come back. We'll keep the light hidden if you don't like it. He turned to me. It's a damn queer rig, this, but I think there's nothing to be afraid of. There was a question in his tone, and I replied. No, I think the poor devil's been wrecked around here and gone crazy. 
The sound of the oars drew nearer. Shove that lamp back in the binnacle, said Will. Then he leaned over the rail and listened. I replaced the lamp and came back to his side. The dipping of the oars ceased some dozen yards distant. Won't you come alongside now? asked Will in an even voice. I've had the lamp put back in the binnacle. I, uh, I cannot, replied the voice. I dare not come nearer. I dare not even pay you the, well, well, for the provisions. That's all right, said Will, and hesitated. You're welcome to as much grub as you can take. Again, he hesitated. Oh, you are very good, exclaimed the voice. May God, who understands everything, reward you. It broke off huskily. The, um, the lady, said Will abruptly. Is she here? Oh, I have left her behind upon the island, came the voice. What island? I cut in. Oh, I know not its name, returned the voice. I would... To God, it began, and then checked itself just as suddenly. Oh, could we not send a boat for her? asked Will at this point. No, said the voice, with extraordinary emphasis. My God, no. There was a moment's pause. Then it added in a tone which seemed a merited reproach. Oh, it was because of our want I ventured. Because her agony tortured me. I am a forgetful brute, exclaimed Will. Just wait a minute, whoever you are, and I will bring you up something at once. In a couple of minutes he was back again, and his arms were full of various edibles. He paused at the rail. Can't you come alongside for them? he asked. No, I dare not, replied the voice, and it seemed to me that in its tones I detected a note of stifled craving as though the owner hushed a mortal desire. It came to me then, in a flash, that the poor old creature out there in the darkness was suffering for actual need for that which Will held in his arms, and yet, because of some unintelligible dread, refraining from dashing to the side of our schooner and receiving it. And with the lightning-like conviction, there came the knowledge that the invisible was not mad, but sanely facing some intolerable horror. Damn it, Will, I said, full of many feelings over which predominated a vast sympathy. Get a box. We must float off some stuff to him in it. This we did, propelling it away from the vessel, out into the darkness by means of a boat hook. In a minute a slight cry from the invisible came to us, and we knew that he'd secured the box. A little later he called out a farewell to us and so heartful a blessing that I am sure we were the better for it. And then, without more ado, we heard the ply of oars across the darkness. Pretty soon off, remarked Will, with perhaps just a little sense of injury. Wait, I replied. I think somehow he'll come back. He must have been badly needing that food. And the lady, said Will. For a moment he was silent, and then... He continued, oh, It's the queerest thing I have tumbled across since I've been fishing. Yes, I said, and fell to pondering. And so the time slipped away. An hour, another, and still Will stayed with me. For the queer adventure had knocked all desire for sleep out of him. The third hour was three parts through when we heard again the sound of oars across the silent ocean. Listen, said Will, a low note of excitement in his voice. He's coming, just as I thought, I muttered. The dipping of the oars drew nearer, and I noticed that the strokes were firmer and longer. The food had been needed. They came to a stop a little distance off the broadside, and the queer voice came again to us through the darkness. Schooner, ahoy! That you? asked Will. Yes replied the voice. I left you suddenly, but oh, there was a great need. The lady? questioned Will. The lady is grateful now on earth. She'll be more grateful soon um, in heaven. Will began to make some reply in a puzzled voice, but became confused and broke off short. 
I said nothing. I was wondering at the curious pauses, and, apart from my wonder, I was full of a great sympathy. The voice continued. We, she and I, have talked, as we shared the result of God's tenderness and yours, will interpose, but without great coherence. I beg of you not to, to belittle your deed of Christian charity this night, said the voice. Be sure that it has not escaped his notice. It stopped, and then there was a full minute's silence. And then it came again. We have spoken together about this, which has befallen us. We had thought to go out without telling anyone of the terror which has come into our lives. She is with me in believing that tonight's happenings are under a special ruling, and that it's God's wish that we should tell you all that we have suffered since... Oh, since... Yes? said Will softly. Oh, since the sinking of the albatross. Ah! Oh, I exclaimed involuntarily. She left Newcastle for Frisco some six months ago, and hasn't been heard of since. Yes, said the voice. But some few degrees to the north of the line, she was caught in a terrible storm and dismasted. When the day came, it was found she was leaking badly, and presently it fell into a calm... The sailors took to the boats, leaving leaving a young lady, my fiance, and myself upon the wreck. Now we were below, gathering together a few of our belongings when they left. They were entirely callous, through fear, and when we came upon the decks, we saw them only as small shapes afar off upon the horizon. Yet we did not despair, but set to work and constructed a small raft. Well, upon this we put such few matters as it would hold, including a quantity of water and some ship's biscuits. Then, the vessel being very deep in the water, we got ourselves onto the raft and pushed off. It was later when I observed that we seemed to be in the way of some tide or current which bore us from the ship at an angle, so that in the course of three hours, by my watch, her hull became invisible to our sight her broken mast remaining in view for a somewhat longer period. Then, towards evening, it grew misty, and so through the night. The next day we were still encompassed by the mist, the weather remaining quiet. Oh, for four days we drifted through this strange haze until, on the evening of the fourth day, there grew upon our ears the murmur of breakers at a distance. Oh, gradually it became plainer, and somewhat after midnight it appeared to sound upon either hand at no very great space. The raft was raised upon a swell several times. Then we were in smooth water, and the noise of the breakers was behind. When the morning came, we found that we were in a sort of great lagoon. But of this we noticed little at the time, for close before us, through the enshrouded mist, loomed the hull of a large sailing vessel. With one accord we fell upon our knees, and thank God, for we thought that here was an end to our perils, for <sighs> much we had to learn. The raft drew near to the ship, and we shouted on them to take us aboard, but none answered. Presently the raft touched against the side of the vessel, and, seeing a rope hanging downward, I seized it and began to climb. Yet I had much to do to make my way up, because of a kind of grey, lichenous fungus that had seized upon the rope, which blotched the side of the ship lividly. I reached the rail and clambered over it onto the deck. Here I saw that the decks were covered in great patches with grey masses, some of them rising into nodules several feet in height. But at the time I thought less of this matter than of the possibility of there being people aboard the ship. I shouted, but none answered. Then I went to the door below the poop deck. I opened it and peered in. There was a great smell of staleness, so I knew in one moment that nothing living was within, and with that knowledge I shut the door quickly, for I felt felt suddenly lonely. I went back to the side where I'd scrabbled up. My sweetheart was still sitting quietly upon the raft. Well, seeing me look down, she called up to know whether there were any aboard of the ship. I replied that the vessel had the appearance of having been long since deserted, but that if she would wait a little, I'd see whether there was anything in the shape of a ladder by which she could ascend to the deck. Then we'd make a search through the vessel together. 
A little later, on the opposite side of the decks, I found a rope side ladder. Well, this I carried across, and a minute afterwards she was beside me. Together we explored the cabins and apartments in the after part of the ship, but nowhere was there any sign of life. Here and there, within the cabins themselves, we came across odd patches of that queer fungus, but well, this, as my sweetheart said, could be cleansed away. In the evening, having assured ourselves that the after portion of the vessel was empty, we picked our ways to the bowels, between the ugly grey nodules of that strange growth, and here we made a further search, which told us that there was indeed none aboard but ourselves. This being now beyond any doubt, we returned to the stern of the ship and proceeded to make ourselves as comfortable as possible. Together we cleared out and cleaned two of the cabins, and after that I made examination whether there was anything eatable in the ship. This, I soon found, was so. I thank God in my heart for his goodness. In addition to this, I discovered the whereabouts of the fresh water pump, and having fixed it, I found the water drinkable, though somewhat unpleasant to the taste. Ah, for several days we stayed aboard the ship, without attempting to get to the shore. We were busily engaged in making the place habitable. Yet even thus early we became aware that our lot was even less to be desired than might have been imagined. For though, as a first step, we scraped away the odd patches of growth that studded the floors and walls of the cabins and saloon, they returned almost to their original size within the space of twenty-four hours, which not only discouraged us, but gave us a feeling of vague unease. Still, we would not admit ourselves beaten, so we set to work afresh, and not only scraped away the fungus, but soaked the places where it had been with carbolic, a canful of which I had found in the pantry. And yet, by the end of the week the growth had returned in full strength, and in addition, it had spread to other places, as though our touching it had allowed germs from it to travel elsewhere. Ah, oh, on the seventh morning... My sweetheart woke to find a small patch of it growing on her pillow, close to her face. At that, she came to me, as soon as she could get her garments upon her. I was in the galley at the time, lighting the fire for breakfast. "'Come here, John,' she said, and led me aft. When I saw the thing upon her pillow, I shuddered, and then and there we agreed to go right off the ship and see if we could not fare to make ourselves more comfortable ashore. Well, hurriedly we gathered together our few belongings, and even among those I found the funkers had been at work, for one of her shawls had a little lump of it growing near one edge. I threw the whole thing over the side without saying anything to her. The raft was still alongside, but it was too clumsy to guide, and I lowered down a small boat that hung across the stern, and in this we made our way to the shore. And yet, as we drew near to it, I became gradually aware that here the vile fungus which had driven us from the ship was growing riot. In places it rose into the horrible, fantastic mounds, which seemed almost a quiver, as with a quiet life when the wind blew across them. Here and there it took on the forms of vast fingers, and in others it just spread out flat and smooth and treacherous. Odd places it appeared as grotesque, stunted trees, seeming extraordinarily kinked and gnarled. Oh, the whole quaking vilely at times. At first it seemed to us that there was no single portion of the surrounding shore which was not hidden beneath the masses of the hideous lake, and yet in this I found we were mistaken. For somewhat later, coasting along the shore at a little distance, we described a smooth white patch of what appeared to be fine sand, and there we landed. It wasn't sand. What it was, I do not know. All that I have observed is that upon it the fungus will not grow, while everywhere else, save where the sand-like earth wanders oddly, pathwise amid the grey desolation of the lichen, there is nothing but loathsome greyness. Oh, it's difficult to make you understand how cheered we were to find one place that was absolutely free from the growth, and here we deposited our belongings. Then we went back to the ship for such things as it seemed to us we should need. Among other matters, I managed to bring ashore with me one of the ship's sails, which I constructed two small tents from, which, though exceedingly rough-shaped, served the purposes for which they were intended. In these we lived and stored our various necessities, and 
Thus, for a matter of some four weeks, all went smoothly and without particular unhappiness. Indeed, may I say, with much happiness, for, ah, well, for we were together. It was on the thumb of her right hand that the growth first showed. It was only a small circular spot, much like a little grey mole, but, my God, how the fear leaped to my heart when she showed me the place. We cleansed it between us, washing it with carbolic and water. In the morning of the following day, she showed her hand to me again. The grey, warty thing had returned. For a little while, we looked at one another in silence. Then, still wordless, she started to remove it. In the midst of the operation, she spoke suddenly. What's that on the side of your face, dear? Her voice was sharp with anxiety. I put my hand up to feel. There. Under the hair by your ear, a little bit to the front. My finger rested upon the place, and then I knew. Let's get your thumb done first, I said, and she submitted, only because she was afraid to touch me until it was cleansed. I finished washing and disinfecting her thumb, and then she turned to my face. After it was finished, we sat together and talked a while of many things, for there had come into our lives sudden very terrible thoughts. We were, all at once, afraid of something worse than death. We spoke of loading the boat with provisions and water and making our way out onto the sea. Yet we were helpless, for many causes, and, and the growth had attacked us already. We decided to stay. God would do with us what was His will. And we would wait. A month Two months, three months passed, and the places grew somewhat, and there had come others. Yet we fought so strenuously with the fear that its headway was but slow, comparatively speaking. Occasionally we ventured off to the ship for such stores as we needed. There we found that the fungus grew persistently. One of the nodules on the main deck soon became as high as my head. We'd now given up all thought or hope of leaving the island. We'd realised that it would be unallowable to go among healthy humans, with the things from which we were suffering anyway. With this determination, and knowledge in our minds, we knew that we should have to husband our food and water, for we did not know at that time, but that we should possibly live for many years. This reminds me that I've told you that I am an old man. Judged by years, this is not so, but... But he broke off, then continued somewhat abruptly. As I was saying, we knew that we should have to use care in the matter of food, but we had no idea then how little food there was left of which to take care. It was a week later that I made the discovery that all the other bread tanks, which I'd supposed full, were empty, and that, beyond odd tins of vegetables and meat, and some other matters, we had nothing on which to depend, but the bread in the tank which I'd already opened. After learning this, I bestirred myself to do what I could, and set to work at fishing in the lagoon, but with no success. At this, I was somewhat inclined to feel desperate, until the thought came to me to try outside the lagoon, in the open sea. Well, here at times I caught odd fish, but so infrequently that they proved to be little help in keeping us from the hunger which threatened. It seemed to me that our deaths were more likely to come by hunger and not by the growth of the thing that had seized upon our bodies. We were in this state of mind when the fourth month wore out. Then I made a very horrible discovery. One morning, a little before midday, I came from the ship with a portion of the biscuits which were left. And in the mouth of her tent, I saw my sweetheart sitting, eating something. What is it, my dear? I called out as I leapt ashore. Yet on hearing my voice, she seemed confused, and turning, slyly threw something toward the edge of the little clearing. It fell short, and a vague suspicion having arisen within me, I walked across and picked it up. It was a piece of the grey fungus. As I went to her, with it in my hand, she turned deadly pale, then a rose red. 
Oh, I felt strangely dazed and frightened. Oh, my dear, my dear, I said, and could say no more. Yet at my words she broke down and cried bitterly. Gradually, as she calmed, I got from her the news that she tried it the day before, and, well, and liked it. I got her to promise on her knees not to touch it again, however great our hunger. After she promised, she told me that the desire for it had come suddenly, and that, until the moment of that desire, she had experienced nothing toward it but most extreme repulsion. Later in the day, feeling strangely restless and much shaken with the thing which I had discovered, I made my way along one of the twisted paths, formed by the white, sand-like substance which led among the fungoid growth. I had once before ventured along there, but not to any great distance. This time, being involved in perplexing thought, I went much farther than hitherto. Suddenly I was called to myself by a queer, hoarse sound on my left. Turning quickly, I saw that there was a movement among the extraordinary shaped mass of fungus, close to my elbow. It was swaying uneasily, as though it possessed a life of its own. Abruptly, as I stared, the thought came to me that the thing had a grotesque resemblance to the figure of a distorted human creature. Even as the fancy flashed into my brain, there was a slight, sickening noise of tearing and I saw that one of the branch-like arms was detaching itself from the surrounding grey masses and coming toward me. The head of the thing, a shapeless grey ball, inclined in my direction. I stood stupidly, and the vile arm brushed against my face. I gave out a frightened cry and ran back a few paces. Oh, there was a sweetish taste upon my mouth where the thing had touched me. I licked them and was immediately filled with an inhuman desire. I turned and seized a mass of the fungus, and then more and more. I was insatiable. In the midst of devouring, the remembrance of the morning's discovery swept into my mazed brain. It was sent by God. Well, I dashed the fragment I held to the ground. Then, utterly wretched and feeling a dreadful guiltiness, I made my way back to the little encampment. I think she knew, by some marvellous intuition which love must have given, so soon as she set her eyes on me. Her quiet sympathy made it easier for me, and I told her of my sudden weakness, yet omitted to mention the extraordinary thing which had gone before. I desired to spare her all unnecessary terror. But for myself, I added an intolerable knowledge to breed an incessant terror in my brain for I doubted not, but that I had seen the end of one of those men who had come to the island in the ship in the lagoon. And in that monstrous ending, I had seen our own. Thereafter we kept from the abominable food, though the desire for it had entered into our blood. Yet our drear punishment was on us. For day by day, with monstrous rapidity, the fungoid growth took hold of our poor body. Nothing we could do would check it immaterially, and so, God, and so we who'd been human became, well, well, it matters less each day. Only, only we had been man and maid, and day by day the fight is more dreadful to withstand the hunger lust for the terrible lichen. A week ago, we ate the last of the biscuit. And since that time, I've caught three fish. I was out here fishing tonight when your schooner drifted upon me out of the mist. God, I hailed you, and you know the rest. And may God, out of his great heart, bless you for your goodness to a, a couple of poor outcast souls. There was a dip of an oar, and another. But then the voice came again, and for the last time, sounding through the slight surrounding mist, ghostly and mournful. God bless you. Uh, goodbye, we shouted together hoarsely, our hearts full of many emotions. I glanced about me. I became aware that the dawn was now upon us. The sun flung a stray beam across the hidden sea, pierced the mist dully, and lit up the receding boat with a gloomy fire. Indistinctly, I saw something nodding between the oars. I 
thought of a sponge, a great grey nodding sponge. The oars continued to ply. They were grey, as was the boat, and my eyes searched a moment vainly for the conjunction of hand and oar. My gaze flashed back to the head. It nodded forward as the oars went backward for the stroke. Then the oars were dipped, the boat shot out of the patch of light, and the thing went nodding into the mist. So a couple more of the old school stories for you right there. Are you enjoying these ones? They are so beautifully, beautifully written. It really is a joy to read them. Well, I'm sticking with my promise to uh, try and churn out an hour's worth of stories for you during the coronavirus outbreak. Let's see how long I can keep it going. Um, two beautiful stories there for you. Did you like those? Would you like me to uh, mix it up, do something a little bit different? I have um, quite a few things planned for you, but let's see how it goes. All right. I'll be back again tomorrow. If not here, then on my second channel, but definitely somewhere. So until then, very, very sweet dream. And bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Doctor Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>